will be there it is okay so good afternoon everyone my name is Nora Silver I'm the founder and faculty director of the Center for Social Sector Leadership and this is one of our the second in our speaker series of path bending careers we want to look at how careers happen for people people who lead interesting careers and are doing particularly interesting work now. And so I'm delighted to have join us Joe Spiker today. Um, Joe's had a very rich multi-sectoral career um, and he's now working in corporate philanthropy. I'm not gonna give you a detailed introduction because he's gonna talk you through the career choices he made, his learnings and what he's doing now. I gave Joe a virtually impossible task to talk about three different topics, which he has um, willingly accepted and is going to integrate. Um, but one that I wanna um, surface right now is his career, the future of work, um, and how social action can happen in the corporate setting, particularly with corporate philanthropy. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe. Joe, take it from here. Joe's gonna present I've got a set of questions for him and then we'll open it up for questions from anyone who wants to ask them. Feel free to, to wait to ask a question, raise your hand or put it into the chat. Anyway, you can you wanna join us is fine, okay? Joe, to you. Thank you, Nora. And hi, everybody. Nice to meet everyone. Um, I'm gonna um, share with you um, a bit about my career journey um, and then talk about what I'm doing today at Autodesk, kind of how I've arrived here, and then finish up with a couple of takeaways that I think would be relevant and germane to this audience. Um, and then we'll go to the, the, the Q&A part. And I think Nora's got some um, questions that she's really gonna stick to me. So I think it'll be a fun back and forth. Um, I am at present uh, the executive director of the Autodesk Foundation. We are the philanthropic arm of Autodesk. For those of you who are familiar with the company, um, we or who are not familiar with the company, um, AutoCAD is, is our big product and we are sometimes known as the AutoCAD company. Um, we are design and engineering software for people who make things. So um, the built environment, um, products from cars to iPhones and actually um, even needing entertainment, the special effects that you see in your favorite Marvel movie, a lot of that is enabled through Autodesk software. So my job is to take that kind of corporate um, value and turn it into societal benefit in some way. And I'll talk about that today. Through this work, um, I've actually uh, also been asked to lead the Future of Work Initiative at Autodesk, which is a corporate initiative, um, which focuses on how we are helping prepare our customers, our employees and our communities for the future of work. And I'll talk about that as well. Lastly, I sit on the sustainability um, uh, leadership team. We help to uh, enable sustainability through our customers because they're designing and, and engineering things within our tools. Um, but three titles was too much for this presentation. So I kept it down to two. Um, I oh, make sure I can advance. There we go. Um, I've, I've got a uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek safe harbor statement. Um, for those of you familiar with safe harbor, this says I'm not liable for any of the things that I say. Um, but I think it's important to note that um, there are qualifiers to these career discussions. Um, and I just wanted to call them out and be explicit about it. So um, hindsight, um, it is really easy to look back and say, this is my career path and this is how I arrived here. When it's happening at the present time, it's incredibly challenging and not nearly as clear. And so while it sounds nice, it's, it's tumultuous at the time. And I think that that's important to note for folks who are, who are in situ on a career path, particularly those um, who are potentially graduating during this time of upheaval, um, COVID. Um, I also think it's important to note that every career move is a choice and all choices involve chance. Um, I've been incredibly lucky. I hit the genetic jackpot as a white heterosexual American male um, I've been given lots of excellent chances, um, but I think it's also important to note that, you know, the company that you might want to work for isn't hiring at this time. And so, um, uh, you know, how to, how to recognize that um, there is a lot of probabilities within career moves. Um, but I do think that you can kind of make your own chances or set up the conditions for serendipity. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then lastly is the rate of change. Um, some of my work 
uh, around the future of work is noting that the rate of technological change is happening at such a quick pace that some of this uh, work is, some, some of the things that we'll talk about today might be dated. Um, and I just wanna note that. So um, grain of salt with all of this. Um, some of the themes that have become clear to me in my career, so I've been um, officially out of undergrad for two decades now, um, are these three things that I think are, are overlapping and, and interwoven. The, the nexus of business and society. Um, I've spent a lot of time working kind of at this confluence, and I think a lot of people can say that, right? Um, uh, uh, for instance, the Haas is a municipal uh, entity creating the next generation of business leaders. That is the confluence of business and society, depending on your definition. Um, but I think that in my career, I've, I've gravitated toward that and attempted to accentuate it because it is so important, I believe. Like business needs to understand its role in society and vice versa. The second theme that's become um, uh, relevant to my career path is, is risk tolerance. So I've learned that I, relative to others, have a high risk tolerance. Um, and that is, um, you know, I, I, I left a job on Wall Street to go to the Peace Corps. Um, I left a, a nonprofit that I'd helped to found without any plan or intention. And um, I've learned that that's, th those are risky moves that have ultimately paid off, but everybody has their own risk tolerance and it changes over time. Um, my wife and I, who is about to actually come into the picture because I think she's gonna deliver me coffee, uh, are expecting twins in Q1 of next year. And my risk profile has changed significantly because of that. Um, uh, and then lastly is the buy side versus sell side um, um, piece of advice that I got. So early in my career, somebody asked me, are you a buy side guy or a sell side guy? Buy side um, is an orientation towards, well, sorry, buy side jobs typically have resources to allocate um, and have an orientation towards certain characteristics like um, analytical, long-term view, maybe aloofness. These are jobs like in the investment sector and philanthropy. Um, and people tend to gravitate towards one or the other. On the sell side, it is mobilize every resource to realize the vision. And um, it attracts people who are the passionate implementer, get your hands dirty kind of thing. Um, my wife is going to great pains not to be in the frame. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and um, I, in my career, I've kind of gone, gone between the two. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but typically, folks tend to, to gravitate towards one or the other. Um, so my meandering path. Um, when I graduated from undergrad, all of the smart kids were going to Wall Street. Um, and without thinking too deeply about it, I did the same. Um, simply because it seemed like that's what, uh, if, if you had a, a head on your shoulders, that's what you did. Um, I worked with a, a, a group of really intelligent, ambitious folks, um, actually at a division of Deutsche Bank called Bankers Trust. Um, for those who know their financial history, Bankers Trust um, fell afoul of the SEC in the 90s. Deutsche bought them um, and they fell afoul because they were selling products that their customers didn't necessarily understand. They had pioneered a lot of derivative products. Um, I worked on a derivatives desk. Uh, I worked in uh, Muni, Ribs and Reits, for those of you who are familiar. Um, and I really enjoyed the, the work, um, but um, it was missing something. Um, and, and I learned, uh, and, and I don't talk about this very often, but um, the Deutsche offices I worked out of was at 40 Liberty Street, which was directly across from the South Tower of the World Trade Center. And uh, that was a um, somewhat of a wake up call and, and very wonderfully um, didn't affect me greatly. I was fine and uh, made me realize that I wanted a career with purpose. Um, and I think a lot of people spend their 20s trying to figure out what those non-negotiables are in their career. And within the first year of being in the working world, I got to understand one of those non-negotiables that I needed to do something that was benefiting society in some way. So. I somewhat naively as a 23 year old immediately applied to the Peace Corps to change my career. Um, and without realizing that it takes uh, a good year to two years to get through the Peace Corps application and placement process. So in the interim, I worked for a firm called Cambridge Associates, 
Um, it's a financial consulting firm that mostly works with uh, endowments, uh, mainly colleges and universities. Um, and um, I spent about two years there while planning to go in the Peace Corps. I was placed in, um, if anybody's familiar, with the Philippines. And, and when searching for images, I thought that this dichotomy was appropriate. You can go to places in Manila that are nicer than um, uh, certain areas of Park Avenue, and you can go to rural places um, like you'd see on the left here, where you have no, um, you would recognize nothing familiar with OECD countries. Um, when Peace Corps volunteers talk about their experience, they tend to try to talk about how rough it was. Um, I was in a middle income country. I was an hour away from a, a fairly large town. I could go see a movie when I wanted to. So um, I, I wasn't terribly um, uh, struggling, um, but I worked for uh, technically a zoo. Um, and so uh, cue in all the jokes about going from Wall Street to a zoo in the Philippines. But um, the World Bank was giving the Philippines funding for uh, something that they call the debt for nature swap uh, they were, the zoo had a, a very successful animal husbandry program. They wanted to reintroduce these animals into the wild. And they made this logical jump that if the villages located within this virgin forest where they wanted to reintroduce the animals had business, uh, businesses going, small business, they'd be less likely to kill an endangered species that would just reintroduce. It was a big jump in logic. And a lot of my work there was um, around kind of environmental education how to take advantage of conservation and monetize conservation versus uh, the other side, which was kind of um, uh, uh, extract the resources of uh, the, nat the natural ecology. Um, I learned there a lot about kind of um, something I call making your own weather that I'll talk about in a bit, but it was a great way to kind of transition out of a financial career. Um, I then went to grad school like many Peace Corps volunteers and I, I went to Columbia University um, of which in hindsight, I'm a little conflicted about, but um, one of the nice things about graduate school and, and about big institutions like Berkeley is the ability to cross register and explore. And so I spent my two years at Columbia really exploring to the point where when I was, when it came time to graduate, um, I was in a little bit of trouble. Like I had to work closely with the Dean to kind of back end all of the classes and make it look like I was working towards some sort of integrated degree. Um, but it was one of the best periods in my young life to kind of figure out what I wanted. I went to Columbia thinking that I was going to be a China scholar. I studied Chinese, spent a summer in China um, because China had brought half a billion people out of poverty. And I was fascinated by that. I thought that that was such an interesting thing to study. Um, and when I was there, I got really interested in social enterprise, which was this kind of burgeoning field at the time. It was the late 2000s. A lot of new money in the Bay Area. Um, was funding this. So Piero Midiar from eBay, Jeff Skoll from eBay, Bill Draper from Draper Richards Kaplan were funding these new initiatives around um, uh, applying business principles to social issues. Um, and so that, that's how I ended up um, coming out to San Francisco. But um, yeah, let me I'll just jump ahead. So I ended up meeting a gentleman who, um, who had an idea about taking the business model from, from Avon ladies selling cosmetics and costume jewelry and applying it to um, essential goods like health products and, and, and actually um, economic products that saved money for families. Um, and I said, I would love to help you with that. Um, and we founded Living Goods. So I was on the founding team. Um, and it was again at this nexus of business and society, taking a business model that could work when applied towards a social issue. Uh, and so I spent five years there as the operations lead um, and basically spent, uh, I would spend a month in San Francisco and a month um, uh, in our field offices, which we started originally in Uganda and expanded to Kenya, Peru, Myanmar, et cetera. Um, and it was a great, um, I, again, I learned a lot about I'm kind of creating your own weather, um, particularly in low resource settings where the stakes are lower, you can really make a lot of things happen. Um, so um, I also learned when to leave the party. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my takeaways, but like when is the right time to move on? Um, and 
my work at Living Goods actually helped to um, facilitate my transition to Autodesk. But I do want to quickly talk about um, uh, pursuits that I've engaged in that were outside of like the traditional career sphere. So um, as I mentioned, like the nexus of business and society, I'm I'm fascinated by um, the the institutions of the private and the public sector um, and the barriers and connections between those and. Um, because of that, and because I want to explore that, I actually sit on two boards. Um, one is with a DC-based nonprofit called the Center for Responsive Politics. Um, they run the website opensecrets.org. It's money in politics. Um, and it's a bipartisan initiative to help make FEC data accessible to folks who want to understand where the money is going in politics. Um, the, the second bit is SPUR, which is a local policy and advocacy shop. Um, that uh, helps to identify the policies that, that helps the Bay Area overall um, succeed from a societal perspective. And I think that the views that are promulgated in these, in, in these two institutions and in the civil society and the nonprofit sector writ large are incredibly important for the business sector. Um, and so it's the reason why at Autodesk, we actually have a board placement initiative to place executives in nonprofit boards because None of this stuff happens in a vacuum. We tend to think of business and philanthropy as siloed entities, but really there's so much interconnection. And I think that there's the opportunity to facilitate that interconnection. Um, and then this is just kind of a fun thing. I am obsessed with coffee. Um, and when I was in grad school, I had the opportunity to spend a summer in Tanzania um, working with coffee farmers. And, and uh, basically I was aware of a program with a nonprofit called TechnoServe that helped coffee farmers to sell into uh, developed markets like Starbucks and Pete's. And I cold emailed them and said, I wanna come work for you. And I spent a summer kind of uh, traipsing around the Kilimanjaro foothills to um, uh, learn why coffee farmers were not utilizing the, the washing stations, which are quality control issues uh, in coffee. At the, at the rate that as has been modeled at TechnoServe. Um, I bring that up because um, when I left Living Goods, um, which, I, uh, which I did um, for a number of reasons, I decided to start a coffee business. Um, and I started selling, I, I started publishing a blog that um, told stories about coffee, about the supply chain and about roasteries. And, um, and then realized I needed to monetize it. So I started selling coffee, special edition roasts and actually got the number of customers up to a couple hundred. Um, and I, I did this all out of my own pocket. Um, I probably spent $30,000 doing it. Um, and um, uh, I, when I got some data back and I crunched the numbers, I realized I needed a couple thousand customers actually to make this work. Selling other people's stuff is a margin game. It's a volume and margin game. And uh, it was pretty tricky. And that's where I realized my risk tolerance when I had to go out and pound the pavement, try to go raise some money. Um, that's where my, my, my risk tolerance ended. Um, and so I ended up selling the website, which I sold it at a loss, but at least it was quote unquote an exit. Um, but it was a really good learning experience for myself. And I think that um, just being able to kind of learn where your limits are and, and, and what you can and can't do is incredibly important from a career perspective. Um, so that brings us to the present day at Autodesk. So I mentioned a little bit about Autodesk. And um, the reason why I ended up there, when I was at Living Goods, I was frequently trying to solve problems that I knew other companies had to grapple with. And specifically that was CPG companies operating in East Africa or in, in low resource settings, uh, supply chain issues, inventory management issues, the issues related to an all cash business. Um, and I would go knocking on doors to Unilever, um, P&G, Rickett Bankhauser, um, uh, Nestle asking for help. And I would frequently be relegated to their CSR function. And it was infuriating um, because those guys couldn't help me solve an inventory management issue. Um, and so I would frequently get on my soapbox and complain about uh, corporate corporates are throwing the baby out with the bathwater by firewalling their philanthropic charitable CSR efforts. Um, so uh, when Autodesk was hire, was was looking to create a philanthropic vehicle, a friend um, whom, whom I had connected with through Living Goods 
actually said, oh, you should talk to these guys because I've heard your soapbox feel many times. And um, so I actually was connected to Autodesk. I went and talked to them about some of these issues. And lo and behold, I was asked to lead their philanthropic work because they, they liked what I had to say. They said, yeah, let's tie it to the business. So I think that uh, philanthropy, this is quite a controversial statement, but I think philanthropy is a net negative for society. I think allowing people to opt out of paying taxes and decide what the social agenda should be is problematic because there is very little accountability in the system as it stands today. And the way to square that circle is by de-risking the solutions in both the public and the private sector that they cannot yet invest in. Um, and so that's how we've structured our philanthropy at, at Autodesk Foundation by helping organizations get over certain risks like the technology risk um, so that deeper pockets can come in and help them to scale, be that in the private sector via some of our impact investments or in the public sector. Mm -hmm. um, we focus on three areas um, and this is directly related to our corporate opportunity, our business value. So energy and materials, health and resilience and work and prosperity. Um, these very nicely correlate um, to issues, what I think are the two largest issues that we have as a society, climate change and inequality. Um, and uh, what's really nice about this and what, where things get interesting is, is that this framework is now the basis for our corporate ESG strategy. So the philanthropy in a certain way was the tip of the spear for helping to build this into the DNA of the company. Um, and we, we, we intentionally facilitated that. So the left-hand side here, investments, grants and, and investments is what typical philanthropies do, but we've really tried to build this into the business by leveraging our technology. Um, so in addition to uh, this year, we'll deploy roughly 10 million in grants. Um, we'll deploy probably in the neighborhood of 40 million in in-kind services. That's technology and talent. That's leveraging our internal corporate resources to do so. So um, in 2017, the company said, hey, we, um, we are integrating machine learning and algorithmic tools at a fast clip, and it's going to radically change how people engage with our tools. And because we're an enterprise uh, solution, we're typically late to the party. We really need to get ahead of this. And can the foundation start investing in workforce initiatives to help folks digitize and upskill, et cetera. So our foundation looked at this for the majority of 2008, 2018, excuse me, we did a number of research grants. Um, we did some get to know you grants and we quickly came to the conclusion that this was a corporate problem, um, that the rise of machine learning and uh, algorithmic tools requires an all hands on deck approach and we better be sure that we are bringing our customers along board um, as well as our employees to these changes. And so in 2019, um, after some back and forth with the company, a little bit of pounding on the table saying, philanthropy can only do so much and, and the business needs to do a lot more. Um, I was asked to lead the future of work initiative across the company. Um, now, um, looking at kind of like the trends here, um, I frequently go to the Edelman Trust Barometer, which I think is a really good gauge on how people, the citizenry, the populace, and this is global, is thinking about um, institutions. And the future of work is at the top of lots of people's minds because um, generally the way that the labor market is going, it doesn't seem to be benefiting workers on the whole. And the really scary number here is this 56% of respondents to the Edelman Trust Barometer believe that capitalism as it exists today does more harm than good in the world. And to me, it's somewhat validating to say, well, that's why I'm so interested in this business and society piece because essentially the public sector creates the rules for capitalism and then the rest of us follow those rules in the private sector. And how can we set this up so that it works better for everybody? And we see trends here. Um, uh, for instance, the, the, within the last year, the Business Roundtable Advocacy Group redefining the role of a corporation. I'm sure many folks at Haas are familiar with this um, to expand the aperture to include employees, customers, and communities. Um, many companies are lining up behind the SDGs. I think a lot of this today is talk, um, but that 
is the that that is, that is necessary for us to start taking action. So I think that's a good thing. Um, the other thing is the rise of ESG investing. I think a lot the financial sector has realized that climate change and inequality are big risks to our investments, and um, they they are slowly beginning to push companies to be more thoughtful about managing these risks. And so I think we're at um, an inflection point where we'll see more change. And future of work is a really interesting area to explore this. And so when we, everybody talks about the future of work differently. Some people talk about it as in terms of the gig economy. Some people talk about it in terms of globalization. Um, what we are talking about, when, what, what I am talking about when I say future of work is the confluence of the labor market, technology and specifically technological disruption. And within the last year, we've added this notion of disruption um, due to COVID, uh, the increasing frequency of climactic events like the California wildfires, the Atlantic hurricane season, typhoon season in Asia, everybody needs to adjust to these new realities in their work and companies are being called to do more. And so, um, and again, future of work is one of these areas where that's happening. Um, so as I mentioned, our three impact areas are the basis for the corporate ESG uh, strategy. This is, this is what I showed you what it looks like from the, the philanthropic side. This is the corporate side. The overall strategy for Autodesk from a future of work perspective is to facilitate lifelong learning for our customers, employees, and communities for in-demand skills of the future that enables the workforce of today and tomorrow to adapt and thrive in an ever-changing world. Big statement, lots of words there. What do we mean by that? Um, we really think about this from a work and prosperity perspective, and we have three key priorities that underpin this work. The first is foresight. So doing our best to anticipate the skills and capabilities and hence roles and jobs of the future. Um, so we are doing that internally as a company from an HR function. We are also doing that in our markets. Um, what is the future of BIM manager? What is the future architects? What is the future industrial designer? Um, once you've got that, that endpoint, or at least something of a direction, you need adaptive learning pathways to be able to acquire those skills and capabilities. And so and th that is both formal and informal. It is connecting work and learning, and it is adopting a mindset of continuous learning because the pace of technological change is such that we need to be continuously learning. And lastly, um, and this is really brought to the fore uh, this past year is access. We need to ensure that everybody who desires them has access to these learning pathways, this information about the jobs and skills of the future and the ability to, to acquire those jobs and skills of the future. Um, and I'll give one really quick example of where this manifests. I have a whole deck that shows a lot of other information, but um, we are taking the, this dialogue that algorithms and um, robots are taking our jobs and turning it on its head. What you're looking at here is a plug-in to an Autodesk product. The product is called Fusion 360. It's an industrial design and mechanical engineering product. Um, and we use an algorithmic tool to assess the user's um, usage of that product, um, assess their familiarity and proficiency, and then suggest learning content to help them progress on their career relative to others. And so it is really taking algorithmic tools and helping folks to understand, uh, helping folks to upskill using a machine learning tool as opposed to a machine learning tool offsetting somebody's work. Um, this is in beta, it's available now, but um, it's, it's also uh, to be extensible across our product platforms. But I think it's a really interesting example of how this, this plays out in practice. Um, so in the last few minutes, I'm just going to go through a couple of quick uh, takeaways from my career journey, and then we can go into questions. But, but here are the things that I've learned. So I've mentioned this before, but really understanding yourself and your limits, your non-negotiables, your risk tolerance, and, and when to leave the party. Um, one of the biggest learning experiences for me was when to leave living goods. Um, I we had a five-year anniversary celebration in East Africa. We brought together our board, our entire um, employee base at the time was a couple hundred, had a big celebration. And I realized this isn't for me anymore. I don't want to be on the ride to take this um, to the next level. And part of that was personal, like the travel was, was a lot, but 
it was uh, it was really hard because it felt like it was my now that I'm having babies, it seems inappropriate to say this, but it felt like it was my baby. Um, and but 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 it had to be done, and it was um, it was a real journey on self growth. Um, I'll also say um, the uh, exploring um, the coffee initiative was also quite a big learning journey, and where my risk tolerance was, and I think that that's really important to keep in mind from a career perspective. Um, make your own weather. I heard this phrase applied to um, Donald Trump. And I thought, wow, that is a really interesting way to think about that. This guy creates his own weather. And it's actually really applicable to career paths, right? Um, I think the taking, you know, in other ways of saying this is like taking initiative or kind of exploring different avenues. When I was at Cambridge Associates, we spent all of our time focused on half of the balance sheet on the asset side of the endowment. And I was really interested in the liability side. Um, I just like for fun would look at the debt issuances um, of colleges and universities because I had worked in muni bonds. One of my early clients was actually the Regents of California. And, um, and so I, they, somebody said, well, what are you gonna do about that? And I, and I said, I think we should probably report on it. Um, and so I, we created the first debt uh, obligation report for Cambridge. It was kind of like spinning up your own weather. From a future of work perspective, very similar. Um, I came to the conclusion that Autodesk needed to do more of this. And so I went out and I sold this to the relevant business units across the company that we actually needed to do a hell of a lot more as a company. Um, and it was because it was a blind spot for us. So I think that that's an important thing to note, like agency autonomy, making your own weather in your career path. Um, I had a belief that I, I, I assume is shared by others. Um, that at some point in your career, you get to stasis. You just show up at the office and you do the same thing day in and day out. And I have been disabused of that notion regularly throughout my career. And I, I think the corollary to that is always, you need to keep moving forward. You need to keep shedding responsibilities, duties, um, delegating, automating, eliminating things to be able to stay ahead of the next change. Um, by way of example, one of my favorite things to do at, on the foundation team is to really mix it up with our portfolio of grants and investments. And in order to jump into the future work initiative, which I think is, is even more interesting, um, I needed to let go of a lot of those responsibilities. And it was painful because I because I created those processes. I used to do a lot of that myself. Um, but it's a necessary step in order to facilitate career progression. Um, also, you've probably heard me say this previously, but exploration will eventually be rewarded. Um, I, um, I spent a lot of time in personal pursuits like coffee and like uh, some of these board initiatives, and um, they do pay off. It's just there's not a clear ROI in the beginning. And so I think it's important to stay true to yourself and your own interests um, and to explore those things because eventually they will. Um, by way of example, leaving a high paying job on Wall Street, that was actually one of the hardest things I ever had to do was explain to my managing director that I was leaving for the Peace Corps. Um, and it's been the best thing that I could have, best decision I could have made for my career. And so I think engaging in those explorations is really important. Um, and then lastly, invest in the relationships um, um, that, that you really think are valuable. I think that uh, we have a culture at Autodesk of having uh, any intern that ever asks for an informational interview, you say yes. Um, and I think it's a great cultural thing. And many of my engagements with interns are very transactional, very transactional. I mean, they're nice on their face, but it's like, what, what can they extract from this relationship? Um, and there are two that um, I've had relation, have had relationships with and continue to follow their careers over time, one of whom I hired and has since left. Um, but um, I think that investing in relationships where there's not necessarily an ROI will yield benefits. I have one great story um, where I got into an argument with a professor at Columbia who had a class called Entrepreneurship in Africa. And at the time I was hot on China um, and China uh, bringing people out of poverty. And I, I gave him the business about why would entrepreneurship benefit Africa when China's is clearly this good model. I developed a relationship with him, a guy named Paul Tierney. 
Um, he was, he's an investor and an adjunct professor at Columbia. Um, when I was talking to Chuck Slaughter, uh, uh, whom I helped launch Living Goods with, um, Chuck did a blind reference check to Paul Tierney. He happened to know Paul as well. I knew I went to Columbia, asked if I knew this kid and go, oh, that's the kid that uh, I, I got in an argument with. I convinced him to take my class. He was one of the best students I had and, and we had a blast. And so I think investing in those relationships are incredibly important. So, um, sorry, that was my, that's takeaways, know thyself, make your own weather, always keep moving. Exploration will eventually be rewarded and ensure that you're investing in the relationships that are important to you that don't necessarily have an ROI. My quick and dirty takeaways, and with that, I'll stop my soliloquy and hope that that was somewhat valuable to all of you. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. Okay. Yes, of course. So I'm gonna start with some questions. People feel free to jump in with the chat, I'll just start us off, okay? So, Joe, you you um, you thought there was a negative value to philanthropy. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to ask you, what's the positive value in corporations? Do you really think they can be forces for good? And show us. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I, philanthropy is a vehicle, right? It is a vehicle to achieve societal aims. Um, and I think that a lot of philanthropy is misdirected as a vehicle. Um, but the bigger question about corporations um, adding value, I, I look at the adding, adding societal value, um, being a force for good in the world. And there's a couple of like pretty obvious examples, but I don't think that um, they, they, they rise to the fore typically. So the, the original idea behind minimum wage was actually the Ford Motor Company. Um, Ford wanted his employees to be able to afford the product. And so he unilaterally raised minimum wages. The company that does that today is Walmart. Walmart twice has unilaterally risen their minimum wage for their US-based um, uh, employees, uh, of which I believe the last count was 200,000 people work at Walmart. And so I, I think that companies can be forces for good. Um, this is a really, really uh, uh, fraught with controversy response, but uh, Tesla. Tesla proved the unit economics of um, electric luxury cars. And that has forced every other automotive company to attempt to electrify at speed. Um, if Tesla goes away tomorrow, it will not stop the march towards electrification of transport today. And I think that that is an incredible uh, force for good, like demonstrating those unit economics. I also think too, a lot about the CPG companies that I mentioned, um, most folks think of Sub-Saharan Africa as a charity case. You know, we do our, we sell in our developed markets and we donate in places like that. Um, I think that uh, particularly Unilever and Nestle have seen this as actually a market opportunity and have started to treat it as such. And that is incredibly valuable to the African consumer. Um, and sorry, to, this is like a smorgasbord of examples, Nora, but um, I think the mobile phone um, technology has been the best thing to happen to Sub-Saharan Africa um, from, a, from a private markets perspective. Now, interestingly, that was kind of, um, <laughs> that was pioneered by philanthropy. The GSMA Foundation kind of paved the way for that. But, um, but the investments that you see in mobile telephony across the continent have gained access to information that has radically changed markets over there. So those are some of the examples I think that where companies can do well. Where they get dinged is on these like distortions. And I, and I, I come back to that capitalism issue where w the rules of the market that we have set under the heading of capitalism don't always lead to optimal outcomes. And um, we get to change the rules um, to make, to ensure that they work towards optimal outcomes. Um, we don't always realize that agency um, and it, you know, our political processes are, are, are somewhat challenged, particularly in the United States to do so. But, um, but I think that companies can be incented to do the right thing um, by changing those rules or tweaking those rules. So who makes those rules and how, <laughs> how would you get involved now if you were, attempting to, or what are the ways to get involved to change those rules? 
Well, it's interesting. I um, one of the reasons why I'm on the board of the Center for Responsive Politics um, is because I believe that um, money in politics is distorting the rules. So the ability to go in and actually um, influence policy with a check is uh, problematic for setting the rules. Um, and my belief was, was to in help in this way or to engage this topic, we needed more transparency and accountability in where that money is going. Um, uh, it, it, it's interesting, um, in the last four years that I've been on the board of CRP, uh, the locus of attention has been focusing more on partisan um, trying to change the rules than, than the what are the rules in the first place. Um, and, and I think that that's a function of um, locus of control. I think a lot of folks, um, and this election being an example, a lot of folks don't feel as though uh, they can enact change through their individual decisions. Now, while we saw uh, you know, record number of voters in the United States in this election, um, still more than 30% of people did not vote. Um, and I have to believe that's a belief that um, a lack of control over setting those rules. And I think that that's fundamentally what needs to change is, uh, is agency. Folks participating in the process and believing that to be the case. Um, but I don't know if you wanted to take it there. I'm getting into like the philosophy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do. I do. In fact, I want to I want to follow it up. Okay. How do we help people have agency? If, if you were in charge of what's the problem, what would you do? Uh, I come back to, uh, uh, and this is so trite to me, but I come back to education. It is an informed citizenry will make better decisions about where to take society. Um, and, and an informed citizenry also understands the, the, your role with, within society overall. And, um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of our institutions don't promote that, um, that we are part of a greater, greater whole. Um, and that the decisions that I make as an individual have influence on others. If I choose not to wear a mask outside, that can impact others, uh, right? And we actively avoid that. And I think that there's, there's some issues around original sin around the United States and individualism versus collectivism. Um, um, and I think that um, a, a, a two-party system has lent itself towards this notion of zero-sum game, which is wrong. We all know intellectually that it is not a zero-sum game, but um, those at the highest echelons of power who are, who are involved in that game believe it to be zero-sum um, and, uh, and play it as such. And so I think that, uh, back to your original question, uh, uh, an educated citizenry is uh, makes better decisions about where to take society and their role in society. Okay, and because you've worked, you've worked in all sectors at this point, who should lead that or how can different sectors make that happen? Yeah, well, I, so from a sector perspective, um, I think that you're, this is unfortunate, but, but I believe it to be true. Um, that the current administration in the United States has awoken a latent desire to, um, I'm sorry, the, the current administration in the United States has made very clear that uh, business has to understand its role in society and do more to ensure that society is thriving. Because when the public sector abdicates that role, which has happened in various instances where walking away from environmental protections, walking away from investments in education. Um, when, uh, when that happens, the, it, it, it impacts business over the long term. In the short term, it, 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 you know, it, it can be a good thing because you're reducing regulation, but over the long term, it's problematic. And I, I kind of think about, you can, you can say this in multiple ways. You can say like problems are becoming such that it's profitable to solve for them which I believe to be the case, and like, for instance, Tesla, um, you can say business needs 
a thriving middle class or, or society to be progressing in order to succeed, which is clearly the case. Um, or you could say that the problems that we have are such that it requires an all hands on deck response. And so, so to your question around what sectors can do, I think business is starting to realize, the private sector is starting to realize their role in this. And that's why you saw the business roundtable announcement. That's why you see more companies hiring, creating um, philanthropic charitable entities, investing in this space, doing more from a diversity and inclusion perspective, et cetera. Um, so that's a private sector. I think the, the public sector has to awaken to their power. There is nothing to say that, that the public sector can't regulate the private sector into doing this. Um, but the rules of the game are such that the, the public sector doesn't feel as though it can do that today. Um, and you know, there's, there's various ideological notions there. Um, but um, I think that the public sector needs to flex its muscles a bit more. Um, and I think about GDPR, right? Like Europe said, here are the rules if you wanna play in Europe from, from a uh, privacy perspective. And companies were thrilled to say, great, I'm gonna get behind it. Yes, it's costly, but it is one rule to get behind. It's also why you saw so many companies championing the Paris Climate Agreement, because it was like, okay, here is one thing that is, it's certain, it's clear, we're gonna be working towards it. Um, and that certainty is what business needs and wants. And so, so, so again, to, to get back to you asked what needs to happen in these various sectors, I think the public sector needs to flex its muscle a bit and the private sector is just beginning to kind of exert some of its influence on these societal outcomes. And I think you'll see more of that in future. In the nonprofit sector? I think the nonprofit sector needs to be the, um, uh, the like the kingmaker for solutions, right? So um, I, I think about, I, like my, my favorite example is homelessness. Uh, we've got a big homelessness problem. US, California writ large, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, the city and county of San Francisco spends about $400 million a year on homelessness. Um, and that is beds and meals. That's it. And that's just a Band-Aid. That is, that is, and, and they do their best to kind of cycle people through, but um, it's really just like they're doing what they can with the situation. Um, the nonprofit sector has this license to go innovate and, and figure out new ways of approaching this problem and actually get people out of um, homelessness as opposed to just providing beds and meals. And so I think that the nonprofit sector needs to be, and, and they've moved in this direction over the last two decades, much more um, take bigger risks and have a much higher risk tolerance to, to shoot the moon. And we as funders, me as funder, should be willing to uh, uh, take more of those risks in funding those opportunities. Um, because once you've proven that, hey, this is a wildly successful intervention that helps get people out of homelessness, then the public sector can go take it up um, once it's been de-risked. Um, and so I, I think you've, we've, I've seen, you've seen a bit of that with social enterprise and 20 years ago, you, you know, you would talk to a homeless organization and they would talk about, you know, the, the tons of food that have, that have gone through their, you know, uh, warehouses. Now folks are talking about like the number of people served and the number of folks. And so they're getting a little bit of religion around, um, bringing some of these business principles of transparency, accountability, measurable results to the social sector. And I think that needs to continue in addition to a higher risk tolerance for solutions. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, I'm gonna ask you a little bit of a provocative or hard question here. Please. I'm at, you've worked across a number of different issues around the world in different sectors. If you were you're now Joe Spiker, MBA candidate, <laughs> late 20s, early 30s, at Haas School of Business. What would you think about doing now, given what you know of the world? If you were back in, you know, Jake or Michelle or Yanel's place right now, what would you think about doing? I, um, I, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I'm, acutely aware that um, the desire to imbue purpose uh, in a career is unique to, to me. Although I think that we see more and more of that um, uh, with students in, in um, MBA programs and writ large. Um, but I think that 
the, um, I think that when history looks back on this time, and we are living through history today, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I can't wait to read all about COVID in the future and the Black Lives Matter protests and everything. Um, I think that um, history is gonna look back at what we did to alleviate these twin challenges around climate change and inequality. And I think that, as I said before, the problems are such that it's an all hands on deck um, mentality that we need to adopt in order to actually solve these problems. And so, you know, you mentioned institutions, the, 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 the public sector, which is ostensibly in charge of the public good, the private sector, which is in charge of um, the economy, ostensibly, uh, the nonprofit sector, which is kind of like civil society went on. And then there's actually, I think of the media as, as one as well, and um, as kind of an institutional pillar within society. I think all of these institutions have a role to play in terms of attacking these issues. Um, and I would say that um, I would encourage folks to take their uh, unique skills and resources and apply them to these challenges because Unless we solve for them, the future looks uh, bleaker. Well, the future doesn't look as positive um, as it once did. And so these are gonna be issues that we'll be grappling with for quite some time. I, I'm particularly worried about inequality. I, this is a controversial statement, Nora, but um, I think that climate change is a technological issue that we will innovate our way out of. Um, and I'm, I'm not talking about like geoengineering, but I, you know, and I, and I frequently think of the Winston Churchill comment that, um, that um, Americans um, will make, um, will, will, will pursue every path until they have to make the right decision. I think society is like that with climate change. We, we will we'll make every bad decision until we're forced to make the right decision. But, but there is a line of sight. I think we are hardwired for inequality. I think this is like evolutionary biology at work and um, the notion that we are all equal in society um, is one that is not terribly popular um, globally. And so I, you know, I think that there are really interesting career paths to address these twin issues in all institutional, um, in all institutions um, across public, private, nonprofit media. Um, so that's what I would encourage folks. But I don't know if I really answered your question. That was 50,000 foot view. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that was good. It didn't answer what you would do, but it opened up the aperture for what people should consider. Let me open up um, right now to any questions from anyone participating here. Feel free to either unmute yourself, raise a hand or put it in the chat. Nora, there are already a couple of questions in the chat, I believe. Oh, okay, I can't. Oh, okay, sorry, didn't see them. Let me go back. Thank you, Stephanie. All right. All right, here's one. I'll read them. Okay, great. Curious how you advise those of us considering moving into tech company business units that may have more traditional, traditional firewalls and less business line CSR strategies because we believe there is a need to help those companies shift their thinking versus identifying companies like Autodesk that seem to be further along in their decisions to align, I'm gonna broaden it, social good and business objectives. So how do these people, they're not going to Autodesk, they're going to a more traditional company that doesn't see this alignment. You know, one of the, um, so the, the way that I would answer that is, I am pretty amazed um, so when I left Deutsche, I kind of thought that that was it for me in terms of working for a big global multinational publicly traded company. Um, and I find myself back here again. And I am amazed at the power that employees have on the company overall. One email to our CEO can affect internal policy at the company. Um, particularly if it's well put and um, well thought through. And so um, it, it is, it's really interesting. I, I, I see myself a little bit at Autodesk like an opportunity merchant. Like we do a lot of programs with employees and people will say things to me like, um, 
working with the customers in the, in the foundation portfolio has helped me to better, um, and, and this is our pro bono program, has helped me to better uh, operate in my day job, right? And, and I'll get this like wonderful email and I'll say, you know what? You should send that to the, to the C staff. Um, like, don't send it to me. I've already drank the Kool-Aid. I don't need to hear that. Send, send it to the people um, who it can actually influence those decisions. And it's interesting. We brought in a new head of HR um, who within two or three weeks of her coming on board called me and was like, uh, this is the this is the best recruiting tool that we've got, the, the programs that you've got. And so I need you working very closely um, with our TA function um, and our L&D function at the company to ensure that we are aligning programs with our talent acquisition and our learning and development um, so that we can imbue this throughout the company. And so I think that um, taking a career and let me you know it's a more traditional company like a Cisco or an Intel. Cisco, we, we just lost our CFO to Cisco and it's like we announced it earlier last week. It was, it was a big deal. He was on my board for the foundation. It's a, it's a sorrowful thing. Um, but I just started poking around Cisco's 990s and I was like, oh, they're doing a lot of really interesting things. Um, like, let's make that connection. And uh, so, so sorry, I'm, I'm being a little bit discursive, but um, I think that going into more traditional companies and advocating for and provoking leadership to engage in this work is a positive thing. That and actually might be one of the more positive things that folks can do. So um, I, companies that are not uh, particularly tech companies have to be um, responsive to their employees because that's that's what they're made of. Like technology is code and people. And so they, they, you actually have a really good audience there um, to go and advocate for some of this stuff. Okay, here's another question. A couple of questions about philanthropy and corporate interplay, Joe. Yeah. This one from somebody who worked in philanthropy for over five years. So very familiar with the critiques and share some of them but wonder about um, when philanthropy is at its best, it being an engine for innovation and funding some of the riskiest bets. Who are the players in philanthropy that you, well, that you think are moving the needle? Is there anything that excites you that you see in philanthropy? And then the other side, how have you reform the non-exciting part? Oh, that's, that's a great question. This is the book that I'm going to write one day when I have time. Um, oh. So I think that, um, I think that, I think if, again, philanthropy is a tool um, and it's a tool very similar to the public sector, like taking care of the public good. Um, and it's fascinating. It's, you know, I've got some fun facts and figures around the discretionary US government budget um, and it's how it's decreasing and the rising numbers of philanthropy and just how impactful philanthropy can be. Um, but um, I think that there's three types of philanthropic vehicles, essentially. There's, there's kind of like the, um, what I would call the legacy philanthropies, um, which tend to be big strategics. That is the Rockefellers, that is um, the, Unfortunately, even though they're newer, like it's Rockefeller, it's Ford, um, it's Hewlett Packard. Gates actually is kind of created out of this mold. Um, and they have, they set up kind of theories of change with big strategic plans and then go pick off each of those. And inherent in those series of trends is a lot of assumptions and a lot, and, and they are, um, uh, if they're not on the right path, they're not nimble enough to make changes. And so, so I think that, um, the, the, the more interesting ones tend to be on the latter two, which are um, living donor philanthropies. Um, and I'll give a couple of examples of really, I think really cool ones doing good stuff and corporate philanthropy, um, which can be more nimble um, and don't set up these big, huge strategic plans that invariably change every three to five years. So um, one of my favorite foundations is, um, is the Roddenberry Foundation. Um, and for those of you who are familiar, Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek. 
uh, and he's got a family philanthropy. Every Star Trek movie, uh, I'm sure, is licensed by the Roddenberry family, so they're doing quite well. And they do really interesting work, um, and they're very responsive to what's happening in the social and environmental sectors writ large. Um, and I think that they can be very nimble. Uh, another living donor philanthropy is here in the Bay Area is the Milago Foundation, uh, a guy named Kevin Starr, who's become a dear friend over the years. Um, they have a really high risk tolerance and can do lots of really interesting things. They can, they can um, shift on a dime. Can, you know, they used to focus on, I would say, inequality, particularly in developing countries. And, and Kevin uh, got religion around climate, and now they have a climate fellows program and they're investing heavily in climate. Um, of which you don't see a lot of in the big strategics. Um, and then um, uh, corporate philanthropies. Um, I think that I, this is odd, but I think that IKEA Foundation does a lot of really interesting work. Um, I, it, 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 IKEA, <laughs> there's a lot of interesting tax stuff with regards to IKEA, but the, their philanthropic vehicle is fascinating and does really good work globally. So um, I think that it comes down to like nimbleness, responsiveness, and being able to think over the long term. I, what I think needs to happen, so the other part of that question, Lauren, sorry, that was like a long soliloquy, but the other part of that question is there needs to be more transparency in the system that, that I, I, I find it um, kind of amazing how little oversight um, and accountability there is in the philanthropic sector overall. Um, like wh why don't uh, governments say, if, if you want a tax write-off, these are the most important things from a public good perspective and you need to line up and get behind them. And I don't care what how you do it, but um, like showing what's important, like the, 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 the Koch brothers philanthropy, um, most of which is um, not particularly well well utilized. They do some really interesting stuff on incarceration, <laughs> um, and and which is a which is an interesting dichotomy. But I think that um, there needs to be more accountability within the system to get these groups to actually show results from a societal perspective. <clears throat> I'm, I'm fascinated just in a couple of tensions I'm hearing you. And Emma, I, I see you kind of, you may want to jump in here too. Um, but one of the tensions I hear is what you're saying is kind of the best in philanthropy is somebody who's nimble at the same time that they can see the long term. So you've got to hold both of those. You know, it is a tension looking long term, but being able to move. And the other is the public sector defining the need but the best foundations you're mentioning are living donors who tend to be the people who don't want to be told what to do. <laughs> so so there, there are some tensions in here, which are interesting. It's very true. It's very true. But I think that those tensions might be on the how, you know, so, so imagine a world in which the U S government says, okay, um, if you, if you want to maintain your philanthropic C3 status, you have to line up behind uh, an SDG. You have to, and you have to actually report on that. Um, and th that's not out of the realm of feasibility. In fact, it's actually probably good policy. Um, that still allows for a lot of innovation and a lot of creativity and how to go about that um, because there's a thousand different ways to skin that cat. Sure. Um, but as of right now, all you're required to do is basically prove that you're not enriching anybody with your philanthropy, which is I think a total miss on the public sector's part. You're a very strong public sector advocate. Well, I mean. Not as it is maybe, not <laughs> in administration terms, but in terms of what it should and could do. You've mentioned a number of times where the public sector could and should take a stronger stand. Well, and I, I think that COVID has really illuminated the fact that um, we, we need folks looking after the collective. Um, like, and, my CEO says this all the time. He says, you don't want, he's like, I, I'm a, what does he call himself? An oligarch. He was like, I was selected in a, in a back room full of like cognac and cigars to lead a company. Um, the, 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 you need folks that have accountability and, and promote transparency to these things that are public goods. And I'm quite frustrated by the lack of, um, public sector leadership in this space. Um, and and it's, it's, it's not unique to the US, but it is, 
exaggerated in the US. Um, there's a famous study that, that I'm sure you're aware of, Nora, where uh, folks were asked in the US and in Europe, if they got an extra $100 in their paycheck, but they could only donate it, where would they put it to? And every single US participant had their charity of choice. Everybody in Europe said, I'd give it back to the government. The government decides these things, right? And I, um, I think that looking at those other models, like South Korea and China, and, and arguably like not the perfect management, but they have much better COVID outcomes because they've taken a leadership role in the collective good. Compare that to what's happening in the US right now. And it's shocking. And so I just think like, it, it's kind of a no brainer. And I'm really surprised that folks who don't see that and I'm, I, I'm frustrated and advocate for a stronger role in the public sector. I'm right with you. I, I also noticed, you know, when we look at, at, at Berkeley, we're looking at a potential for a certificate in a business school that would be in public policy or a joint MBA and PP degree. Um, because what's offered in the policy school is very little about business. So their students come over to us. And what's offered in the business school is very little um, about the public sector other than avoid regulation as yeah. far as I can see. Um, so I think there's a gap in leadership or in people who can lead and understand across, across these sectors, say corporate and public to yeah. see kinds of synergies that you're talking about. There's a couple of unicorns that do that well, um, who, you know, our, our mutual friend, um, Marianne McCormick's husband does, does a little bit of that. Um, but I do think that it's sorely lacking. And, and, and where it does exist to a greater degree is typically K Street in, in the US where folks go from industry into lobbying and back and forth. And I think that um, like, I, I, this is also very controversial. So apologies in advance. I think that the public sector system that we've set up is selecting for um, the wrong people to be in leadership positions. Um, and uh, like, you know, your returns to your labor are so much greater in a private sector setting versus a public sector setting. And, you know, we frequently see folks who have gone and made their careers and made their fortunes and then go into the public sector. And I think that that's a barrier that needs to be eliminated. Um, and yeah, we could go, I could go on and on on that. <laughs> yeah, so one of the people that Joe was referring to is Tom Khalil who's a director of innovation, interestingly, at a philanthropy at Schmidt. Yeah. Futures, Schmidt Foundation, whatever it's called, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I should have called that out, but yes. No, that's okay. Tom, that's Tom okay. was a Clinton guy and then uh -huh. worked for Obama and is now working with Eric Schmidt, um, chairman of Alphabet, um, on his philanthropic initiatives. And Schmidt does, Schmidt, as a living donor, they do really interesting stuff. Like they just, and, and I would argue that they would probably be thrilled with uh, a little bit more accountability in the system, but would still allow them to do a lot of innovation and interesting work. Sure. The Schmidt, they, they, they have a lot of initiatives, but I think they're another really good one to call out as a really interesting philanthropy doing really interesting work. Interesting. Any other questions from anyone here? If not, I have a, I have a couple before we go. Julia, go ahead and unmute yourself. Sure. Uh, hi, Joe. Um, I'm actually coming to Haas from spending five years in Sub-Saharan Africa as well, most recently in Nairobi. Um, so what you were saying, especially about know thyself, really resonates with me. I've just been thinking as you've been talking about um, what you said about um, the general population education and that being a huge driver of change, um, but also acknowledging the weaknesses in the public sectors and with philanthropies. Um, and then also thinking about that we can't always trust private sector to have consumers best interests in mind when they're doing this education. So I guess who in that system where, who would be the regulating and who would ensure that the education is driving society forward um, versus, you know, driving in a direction that may not be benefiting the greatest good. Yeah, I mean, there's a chicken or the egg problem here, right? Where, um, I, you yeah. know, <laughs> um, there's a really interesting program that's run out of Harvard that um, uh, it's actually run out of the business school and it's, it uses the case methodology to teach um, civics. 
And uh, what they do is, is they basically say like, they present a case that is like um, any business case that you would traditionally read at, um, at Haas or at, at HBS or whatever. And, um, but it's historical um, uh, inflection points in US history. Um, so it is, uh, you know, related to the Constitutional Convention um, at the founding of the United States. Um, and, and students are presented with these issues around like, how would you deal with states' rights versus federal? And, you know, um, same thing with, um, there's a great case that these guys have put forth around the civil rights marches in the 60s um, and MLK and marching with children. And like this notion that like, you might be putting kids in harm's way, but what's more important, nonviolent protests? And I am fascinated by this program. I think it's like a brilliant way to teach civics education. Um, and for my money, I, I, you know, like if, if, if I uh, won the lottery, I'd be, that, that would be my primary uh, uh, modus of, of trying to transition folks to um, a more educated populace. Um, and to your question, like, I don't, I, I know that the public sector needs to be, to take a bigger role here in um, promoting the initiatives to get us to an educated citizenry. Um, I also think like companies are doing this, like, like it's fascinating, but we had this huge, I'm on the crisis management team at Autodesk. Um, we actually had a huge debate about giving um, election day off. Um, we decided to, um, uh, allow folks to leverage their existing volunteer hours if they wanted to do that. But that's unheard of at many companies. Like this is a really, this is a really new area for us where we're bringing in our government affairs team, our chief legal officer to talk about this. And so to, to, I guess to answer your question, Julia, it's like, it, I think it take, it's gonna take a lot of, uh, of folks to um, get us in that direction. Companies are, are realizing that in, uh, that a, an engaged civic uh, society and engaged populace is good for them. Um, and the public sector needs to do so as well. So, I, you know, I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think it's uh, everybody <laughs> needs to do something. Could I just ask you, Joe, the name, if you remember it, of the Harvard program that you're referencing? <sighs> uh, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but uh, okay. it's, 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 it's out of it's, HBS. I can find it for you. I apologize. I don't have it. That's okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. And it's basically teaching civics questions. Is that? It's it's uh, it's targeted at high school students. Um, okay. It teaches civics through the Harvard case methodology, Got and it. what they do today is is they will host um, uh, typically history professors in high schools will come to Harvard for a summer um, a session to learn right. this methodology and then go bring it back to schools. And it, like they, they've, they've uh, graduated a couple thousand teachers, I believe that are going and using this methodology to do so. Um, if, it's, uh, if it's of interest, I can find the name of the program and get it out. I think that's probably enough that we can get it from that. Yeah. But just yeah. to point out that because it's Harvard training teachers during the summer, that's a nonprofit endeavor. Yeah, 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 yeah. totally, totally. Right. So and, the kind of innovation that you were talking about earlier could come from that maybe they can't drive it, you know, as far certainly as, as the public or, or corporate sector, but, but there might be a piece of innovation in there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Others, questions? I've got one for you, Joe. Yeah, please. Um, you kind of, learned from and worked alongside of and know about a, a number of people doing interesting work. Whose work do you most admire and why? Oh, um, I, um, it's a great question, Nora. I, um, I'll let you think for a minute. Well, I've got a, I've got a couple, I'm trying to think about how best to address the question. So, um, uh, there is a gentleman named Stuart Brand, um, who was the founder of the Whole Earth Catalog, who I've gotten to know a bit through some of my work. And um, 
he is also the uh, the one of the founders of the Long Now Foundation, which is based here in the Bay Area and, and promotes long term thinking. Um, they do so through a bar, which is brilliant to me, a nonprofit that owns a bar. Um, but um, they, uh, I, I, I was talking to Stuart about um, like what career advice would he give to folks? And he was like, you know, when I came up in the 60s, it was all about ideas and people throwing out ideas and and seeing what sticks, you know, and, and, and the influence of that can still be, it still resonates today. Um, and he said, I, I think that we have a scarcity of new ideas today, that everybody's retreated somewhat into their silos. And what we need is provocative new ideas. He's currently um, involved with an initiative with his wife um, to rehabilitate the woolly mammoth via genetic, uh, <laughs> genetic CRISPR Cas9, essentially, um, because it can have impacts on, or, or, or the argument is, is that it may have impacts on climate change in the Siberian tundra. Um, and it's really provocative. It, it, it gets people all worked up because we're suddenly playing Jurassic Park and it's a little bit scary. Um, but it goes with his ethos of like promoting new ideas and like, you know, we should be exploring these various things. It, he points to a win, which is like the American chestnut, which is a tree that was destroyed. Through oh, yeah. A, yeah. And now we've been able to actually rehabilitate that through genetics. And so I think, and I think Stuart Brand is a, a brilliant um, promoter of ideas and, and brings those for us. I also think too, and, and again, I, I apologize that these aren't in my, um, like the traditional sphere of philanthropy, but um, I, I also um, am somewhat obsessed with Malcolm Gladwell's podcast. His books, I, you know, I think are, um, you can say lots of things about his books. However, he is he has kind of perfected the podcast medium, and it's taking an idea, traditional, typically in history, um, be it recent history or or far in the past, and looking at it in a new light, and um, and I think it just opens up whole new avenues of exploration for how to think about solving some of our problems. <laughs> so, um, I'm for this is just a plug. I, I'm I'm taking no advertising dollars from revisionist history. But I think that that podcast um, does does a lot to kind of open up people's minds to new ideas and ways of thinking, um, and the Long Now Foundation. So, I, um, I I could go on, but I think that the the promoting new ways of thinking and new ideas are incredibly important. And I think that those two people, Stuart Brand and Malcolm Gladwell, are luminaries in that space. Thank you. So, um, Joe, I really want to thank you for this talk. I, I, you know, I attend a lot of talks at Berkeley and elsewhere, and I think we got into some depth and certainly a wide range of ideas. I really thank you for that, also for being a bit provocative and not just saying what one is expected to say as an executive director of a corporate <laughs> foundation. So thanks for being forthcoming. Thanks for taking the time with our students want to wish you the best moving forward with some twins. Thank you. And that, you know, 20 years from now, they live in a world where climate change is better <laughs> and equality has been, if not eliminated, greatly, greatly reduced. So wish you best in the future, in the next coming months and um, in your work and with your kids. Thank you, Nora. Thank you for the opportunity. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And I, I love the provocative questions. I, that was fantastic. So thank you again. I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I, uh, I hope this was of use to the audience. I suspect it was. Anybody want to say anything else? <laughs> Joe, quick question. Um, thank you so much. One thing you just mentioned, um, American chestnut recovery mm. um, through because it's not technically extinct currently, right? Yeah, no, but the but they've been able to. You're it, you're totally right. Um, but they've been the the they. It is an example of being able to um, leverage technologies to rehabilitate trees. So that is good. Good point. <laughs>
I would encourage you to watch the Stuart Brand um, documentary that was just released. It's excellent and they touch on this. Yeah, will do. Um, thank you so much for, for talking. It's, it was really a pleasure. Um, I had another question if we have a couple of minutes left. Yeah, just a couple minutes, go for um, it. How do you think about the, so philam, uh, uh, philanthropy as like uh, an agent to kind of help uh, kickstart markets? Like what does that transition look like if you're gonna pass it off to the public sector or especially if the private sector is gonna come in like um, like your Nestle's or Unilever's? Like that is like a really interesting space um, and how do you decide when and how that happens? Yeah, it's a little bit of art and science, but um, I can give you some specific examples of the work that we're involved in that might might be clear. So, um, so there's an entity called the Prime Coalition. Um, it's a. Are you familiar? It's a. They're a nonprofit that has a fund called the Prime Impact Fund. It's a. Yeah. It's a, yeah. And um, what Prime has done um, in terms of field building is brilliant with the creation of the Crane Tool. And so um, I'll like, by way of ex what the crane tool is, it stands for um, carbon reduction assessment of new enterprises. And um, it basically is a model through which uh, any sort of uh, new, typically hardware, sometimes software or, or um, materials company can kind of put in their business model and it will, from an apples to apples perspective, like model out what their carbon um, ERP, um, emissions reduction potential is. Um, and so um, I think that philanthropy, we invested in that, we provided grant funds to that initiative. Um, that paves the way for other investors to come in and say, oh, okay, this is a for-profit company. It's in my industry of choice. Um, and now I can better understand the emissions reduction potential for this um, and potentially get ahead of coming regulation or whatever it might be. Um, there's there, uh, what we do specifically is help organizations get past some of those early stage risks to be able to get to um, long-term viability and scalability. Um, we focus, the, the example I just gave is not related to this, but we focus on technology risk. How can we prove out the technology? And we can, we can leverage a lot of assets within Autodesk to be able to do that. Um, but the crane tool is an example of, um, let's get everybody on the same page for what this looks like. So you're comparing apples to apples. And so the venturing arm of, of, of a large company that, um, know, that has committed to carbon emission reduction targets can say, okay, I'm gonna invest in this thing. Um, Amazon just launched their carbon fund, a couple billion dollars. Um, and what they brilliantly did was they looked at their material materiality and they said that the two things that are um, our biggest footprint are data centers and transport. And so they are investing in um, uh, innovations that reduce the emissions potential in data centers and transport. Um, and um, we, they're talking to us about what are some of the technologies that we as much deeper pockets can come in and carry forth. So does that answer your question? Is that, does that kind of get to the heart of what you're like thinking about, like um, making that on-ramp easier for bigger dollars, bigger corporates? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing, um, looking at specific opportunities that, uh, can then take like from the beginning looking at how is this going to take on private money and carry forward um later i mean with 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 co2 reduction um most of that stuff is is in the private sector these days like the the actual emission reductions is it's it's a developed market um which is and paved the way by philanthropy um you know but um but that's why we do impact investing is because that's where all the fun stuff is happening. And if we can de-risk some of these innovations um, to help them get to scale, that, that achieves our impact goals. <clears throat> I think that's a good summary right there. Okay, we are at time. I just wanna be respectful of that. Joe, thank you so much again. Jack, thanks for your question.